All right, a good morning again, saints, and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. Amen. We want to welcome you to the Lord's house today as we worship Him. Uh, a couple of things to keep in mind on way of announcements. Uh, today, of course, our little ones are not present because it is World Adventure Sabbath. Uh, in the World Church. And so they are at the Randolph Church for Adventurers, and this afternoon is Investiture. Uh, that's another good reason and another good motivation, again, why we, we need our own facilities. So, because it's not that we don't have, we have Adventurers in this church as well as Pathfinders. But they have to go on that other side uh, for their programs, so that's another thing to keep in mind. But that's why they're not here today. Sister Yan sends her regards uh, on that and speaking of which I want to thank uh, where is she at sister Lacey for stepping in and you saw her teaching the children's class this morning that did my heart real good when we have new members who are just stepping in feel it that's initiative and I, I, I really appreciate that and that's the kind of spirit and attitude that we that we want so let's continue to encourage her as we see her trying uh, to do her best there, and that's really appreciated. Good to see you here, mainly the visitors. And I think Silas has to put the music for the graduates. Ta, 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 ta. Okay, well, uh, we are celebrating graduation today, and so of Baptist Akia. Okay, good for you. And Sean Ferguson, she's not here today, but he's represented by his parents proud parents. So we have this, I'm going to read something here, this is not a commencement speech, but church entities operate schools from kindergarten through university levels for the purpose of transmitting to students the church ideals, beliefs, attitudes, values, habits, and customs. The source, the means, and the aim of Adventist education are a true knowledge of God, fellowship and companionship with Him in study and service, and likeness to him in character development. Now, those who have children, or we have children going to schools, public schools, the role, ah, now I feel, now we feel better. Thank you, Silly. Very resource, resourceful guy. Okay, and so, what means is that, uh, I lost track of my, what I was saying, okay. Now, those who do not have children in Adventist schools will have to fulfill those gaps. They provide the role of the church. I mean, the parents have to work in their ideals, beliefs, attitudes, values, habits, and customs. So they have to provide that. That is lacking in public schools today. And mainly, when they're in public schools, they have to, in these days, when they bring so much bad staff in schools, they have to double down on the double to do that all the time. Now, a degree does not guarantee success. It helps a lot, but it does not guarantee success. However, success, worldly success, does not save you. It will not save our kids. In fact, it could be counterproductive. Bottom line, if you are, follow, if you are following Christ, then, by God's grace, you have already made the most important decision of your life. Compared to that one, the others are just details. And there's one more thing. This was attributed to Quincy Jones' father. Be your labor great or small, do it well or not at all. And he has more, but I keep repeating that to Lucas. He remembered that as soon as he carried some conscious of things, be your labor great or small, do it well or not at all. Remember the movie of... Uh, uh, gift of hands, when they show Ben Carson's mother, the way that she was able to access, she was able to access education. Remember that? The person that hired her for doing the clinic in the house was surprised by the, the detail of the cleaning. So he was wondering, how come a person can do something simple but so well? And then she was studying the relationship to education. So today we got three graduates, Baptist, Sean, and Pastor Chance, who from now on is Dr. Chance, correct? So let me pray for these people, please. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, 
we ask you that you touch the minds of these graduates that whatever endeavor they had in their lives, they put you in first place. They will have to make decisions, mainly Sean uh, Baptist, that uh, they're going to be find, they will find themselves in crossroads in their lives in which they have to make a decision to follow you or follow the world. We live in the last days. We know that we are the people that are living in the end of the time of the end. However, we don't know where you're coming. Dear Lord, we need to live every day, giving everything to you, putting everything in your hands, and to let us lead us. Lead us. So we ask you that lead them, and they put every plan, every idea, every thought they have in their minds at your feet. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Kind of week. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's more like it. So uh, please stand for our opening song today. Have a great dialogue.
Please, uh, you may be seated. Let's pray. Eternal Father, again, we are blessed to be in your house today. We thank you for sparing our lives to see this glorious Sabbath, and we just pray, God, that our worship today will be renewing. For those who have come with heavy burdens, we ask, O oh God, that indeed they'll be lifted at Calvary. Yes. We pray that, God, that the message will touch each person today where we each need to hear a word from you. And after we have heard this word and depart this place, we pray that, God, that your presence and your power and your spirit will be with us so that we, O oh Lord, during this week, may be a blessing to the people that you put us around. Thank you again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. Just before we introduce our guest speaker, we'd like to, um, the church had prepared a few gift bags for uh, the graduates, so I'd like to invite Brother Baptist to come and uh, represent from the Ferguson's household. If you can come and receive this token on behalf of the church, we want to celebrate you all. Amen. So our clerk is bringing them to you. So, hey, listen, keep striving. Your mama just talked about you a second ago. Okay. <laughs> now this is for Sean. And this is for Baptist. Amen. And this one is for the pastor. Oh, well, amen. <laughs> I got something too. Amen. <laughs> Pass the chance. It's all good. Thank you. Again, congratulations, and we appreciate you. And pass all regards to Brother Sean. Okay, you'll be seated. Thank you. I have the opportunity this afternoon, or almost, almost to introduce our guest presenter to you. It's not an easy thing getting someone from the conference or with his stature to, to be with us, and so we are more than, more than, more than blessed. Um, Jackson Michael Doggett Jr. is a dedicated, ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister with more than four decades, I know he don't look like it, of distinguished leadership experience serving both small and large congregations, hospital boards, and various committees and conference leadership position. Attorney, he's also a man's pastor attorney and all of these things, so we praise God. Indeed, it's a good encouragement for our young people as well to pursue and to achieve all that God has for you. Amen. Attorney Duggett currently serves the Allegheny East Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, which covers Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, uh, DC, Virginia, and parts of West Virginia. As the first in-house general counsel of a regional conference in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He is a member of the American Institute of Parliamentarians and a founding member and current chairman of the board of the National Association for Nonprofits, Organizations, and Executives, NANO. That's where I learned about him. He is the author of the book, Retaining the Harvest, How to Attract, Engage, and Keep the People Who Join Your Ministry, which is available on Amazon, as well as his website, just jacksondoggett.com. Um, Attorney Doggett is also the solutions expert and a master life coach who is passionate about helping uh, pastors grow um, the congregations and ministries they love. He has a vision and a strategy for growing God's church. His broad leadership experience in business, in the community, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church has prepared him to lead God's people in these uncertain times. His preparation included becoming an attorney, who is also an active member of five state bar associations, Pennsylvania, Maryland, D.C., Virginia, Florida, uh, a federal court bar, and the U.S. Supreme Court bar. He has earned certifications as a certified nonprofit executive, a certified diversity professional, certified uh, development executive, as well as a certified nonprofit consultant and a specialist in plan giving and life coach. All of these indeed are but minor accomplishments. But the man personally, he enjoys reading and riding his Harley-Davidson motorcycle, amen. He's a man's man. 
or Trek the Road by uh, are playing uh, um, his soprano and tenor saxophones. These hobbies not only bring him joy, but also reflects on his vibrant personality and varied interests. He is happily married, amen, amen, to the one and only Mrs. Celia Doggett. They share three wonderful adult children, David, Jacqueline, and Jackson III, as well as two grandchildren, Vivian and Charles. After Brother Silas blesses us with this wonderful special music, the next voice you hear is that of Pastor Jackson Doggett. Welcome. In Christ alone do I glory, though I could pride myself on battles won. For I've been blessed beyond measure. And by his strength alone, I'll overcome. Oh, I could stop and count successes like diamonds in my hands. But those trophies could not equal to the grace by which I stand in Christ alone. I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of my source of hope is Christ alone. In Christ alone do I glory, for by His grace I am
shall continually be in my mouth. Amen. It is a blessing to be with you today. I want to thank Dr. Chance for inviting me to come. My assignment today, which he did not give me, God brought me here to help increase your faith. Faith is the victory. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God wants more for us than we can imagine for ourselves. Amen. And without faith, we'll never achieve those goals that God has placed within us. And so I want today to increase your faith. Father, as we open your word, we ask now that you would speak. Convict us, convert us, save us, and lift us to the high place you desire us to live. In Jesus' name. Amen. The New Living Translation of Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us, who is able through his mighty power at work within us, who is able by his mighty power at work through us. The only limit to God's power in your life is you. The text goes on to say, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God wants to accomplish infinitely more than we ask or think to ask. God wants, I, now you're saying, why are you repeating yourself? Because I, I need you to receive it. We read these texts, but we don't often embrace the text. We just get a knowledge of the text. But what the writer of Ephesians is trying to say to us is what I said at the beginning. The limit of God's power in your life is you, not God. God can do anything. We are the only ones who are stopping him from doing it. So I'm going to start again. Now all glory to God who is able, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We all have a tendency to look at our current circumstances and make false predictions about God's will and our possibilities because of what our faith won't let us see. Do you remember the man that came to the disciples with a son who was possessed of a demon and the disciples could not cast the demon out? Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and the man approached Jesus and asked him, if you are able, won't you heal my son? And Jesus' response was basically, the if is not for me. <laughs> Jesus' response was, if you can believe. 
all things are possible. The limit of God's power is our limited faith. Faith is like a muscle that can grow with exercise. But one of our failings is that we do not walk by faith because Paul says we walk by faith, not by sight. But most folk walk by sight, not by faith. We think of what we're able to accomplish and we look back at our history and predict our future by what we were able to do yesterday and limit our possibilities for what can be done tomorrow. That's walking by sight. I don't know if we're able because from what we see, it can't be done. So let's limit our possibilities to what we can imagine. That's walking by sight, not by faith. So it's my job today, by God's grace and his power, to help us to reverse that and walk by faith. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If you're going to walk by faith, you cannot judge the future by your past. It's and evidence but it's hoped for and not seen <laughs> that means it could be something we've never experienced before but it's God's will that we experience and the only reason we wouldn't is we don't believe we can and we don't believe we can because we haven't before But if we have faith, faith is the victory. Amen. So, we only act, we only act at the level of our faith. We almost never act, exercise our faith at the level of God's will. God has so much more planned for us and we limit. It's like the children of Israel in the wilderness. We want to go back. At least in Egypt we had leeks and all kinds of other food. God's out here feeding us manna. We don't like this manna that came from heaven that God served up every day for their nourishment. We don't like what you're offering. I want to go back where I was a slave in order to get what I remember. And we are in the process, children of Israel, of going to a land flowing with milk and honey, and we rather go back because we don't like the trip. <laughs> That's how we often live our life while we come to church and sing the songs of Zion. We're not trusting God to do what only God can do. We are depending on ourselves to do God's bidding. And that's why we can get together and say, we can't do that. That's beyond our ability. It's only be, and you're right, it is beyond your ability, but it's not beyond God's. Amen. And when God gives you an inspiration, it's because he expects to produce it, not because of your ability, but because of his ability activated by your faith. Yes. God always wants 
to do far more for us than we can believe. He always wants to do it. So I'm going to use a story in the Bible, and then I'm going to sit down. John chapter 6, verses 1 to 14, I will not read it. I will just briefly give a synopsis of what happened. Jesus was out in the wilderness, and 5,000 men plus women and children followed him because they heard about the miracle he did for the man that was sick for 38 years, and he was able to be healed. He, they saw Jesus as a miracle worker, and they wanted to come out and see some more miracles. And so there were thousands of people out there, and uh, you know that in the story, Jesus takes two fish and five loaves of bread, feeds the 5,000, and there's uh, extra leftover when everybody had eaten all that they wanted. Now I'm going to come back and talk about some specific areas of that, but most people would believe the focus of this miracle is the hungry crowd. Most people would believe the miracle is about lunch. <laughs> that was a miracle, but that was not the focus of the miracle. Jesus was soon to go to heaven to start the next phase of his intercessory ministry on behalf of us, and he needed the 12 disciples to have such faith in him that they would be willing to die to keep his mission alive when he left to go into his next phase. The problem with the disciples, and Jesus knew it, was that they knew what he could do, but they didn't believe that he would do what was necessary to fulfill the mission God gave Christ as opposed to the mission they wanted him to take on. They wanted to be close to Jesus so that when he overthrew the Roman uh, uh, oppression that, and set up his own kingdom on earth, they would be the leaders in God's earthly kingdom. The problem was Jesus did not come to set up an earthly kingdom at that time. He came to die to allow the whole world to be saved. Who ate? Mm -hmm. 
How do you know that? I'm going to ask you to go home and read John 6, 1 to 14 on your own because I'm not going to take the time to go through it like I thought I would. How do I know that Jesus wasn't looking at just feeding people? Because in there, he says to Thomas, I think, or Philip, I don't remember which one, look it up. <laughs> he, he, he said, why don't you feed these people? And his disciple turned and said, if we worked for a year, we wouldn't have enough money to feed all these people. And the Bible said, Jesus was testing him. Because Jesus knew what he was going to do. He was focused on getting his disciples full of faith. And the disciples were focused on feeding 5,000 men plus women and children. Andrew comes up and says, hey, uh, there's a boy out here. He's selling fish and loaves. He's got two fish, five loaves. And uh, that's all we've got. Jesus said, bring it. Now, when Jesus says bring two fish and five loaves because I'm going to feed the multitude, what is your first thought? Now, of course, on this side of the story, knowing what happened, we say, oh, that's Jesus. He can do it. That's not what you would really think because look, about, look in your own life when you face a challenge. Do you automatically say, oh, this isn't a problem. God can help me fix it. Or do we panic? Yeah. Yeah. This is beyond us. We cannot do it. And so Jesus says, bring the fish and loaves. And they bring them, but that doesn't make sense. Remember this. When God is about to do something special, it almost never makes sense to us. Because God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Higher than the heavens are above the earth are God's thoughts than our thoughts and his ways than our ways. That's why it doesn't make sense to us. But because it doesn't make sense does not mean it doesn't work. So Jesus prays aloud in front of the people and he starts breaking bread and pass it, having the disciples pass it out. Having the disciples pass it out. Now it's important that the disciples pass it out not somebody else. Because he's trying to impact the disciples. And they're seeing, man, there are five loaves of bread, and there's enough, the Bible said, to feed everyone as much as they wanted. They came back for seconds and thirds or whatever else they wanted. He took two fish, and they were small. They weren't big fish. They were small fish. And he fed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread as much as they wanted. And then he said to the disciples, now gather up the fragments that nothing be lost. Notice there were 12 disciples, and the Bible says there were 12 baskets. Why do you think there were 12 baskets when there were 12 disciples? Because the point was not the lunch. The point was to impress the disciples that all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. And I'm going to have a basket for each of you so you will remember what I'm able to do that you cannot do. Now that's my whole point. Is your faith increased yet? <laughs> if your faith is not increased, I've got more stories. <laughs> the point, though, is that it does not matter what God can do if we don't believe he can do it. If we're going to cling to our circumstances, 
rather than cling to his promises, then we are going to constantly be in a condition of lack, of want, of insecurity when God is able to handle every, in fact, every good gift and every perfect gift coming down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In other words, there is nothing that God can imagine that he wants to give to you that you cannot receive if you will just believe him enough to let him do it. We cooperate to the best of our ability, but our actions are not what cause the miracle to take place. It's our faith that he can and he will. Miracles by definition are impossibilities that happen. Jesus goes out on the water because the disciples had gone on ahead and he was praying. And there, he comes out on a storm and walks on the water in a storm. John says, let me come out and walk on the water. Jesus says, no problem. Come on out. Notice an impossibility was being done in front of the disciples. Only one of them thought there was a possibility that they could do it too. And even after, thank you, even after Jesus invites him on the water and he is walking. He's in the act of doing the impossible he gets afraid. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. So if fear came up while he was exercising faith, where did the fear come from? Because the Bible says God has given to everyone a measure of faith. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And he says everyone's got enough to do a lot of stuff. Because faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. You can say get up and jump in the sea and it won't happen. That's all the faith you need to do impossible things. But how many of us exercise even a mustard seed's worth of faith? It's not faith if you can see it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If you can see it, and here's our problem, I will believe it when I see it. So God, if you want me to step out, you got to show me first that I'm not going to drown. Yes. That was the 11 in the boat. John says, I'll step out and see what happens. And he steps out, and then the spirit of fear overtakes him. The beauty of the story is, even though fear overtook him and nullified the miracle, Jesus still saved him from disaster. Yes. Bible says that he took him up and they straightway got in the boat and they were at their destination. That's right. That's right. Even when we fail, he makes sure. That's why he says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he falls, yet he will not be utterly cast down. For the Lord himself upholds him with his right arm. Is your faith increased yet? <laughs> Working on it. <laughs> faith must be exercised in the little things in life. If you can do it, praise God, do it. If you can't do it, 
Ask God, is it his will? If it's his will, his, in, his, his biddings are his enablings. Yes. Yes. The only thing between us and the miracle is our lack of an exercise of the little bit of faith that we have. Grow faith, see greater miracles. Now, question. Would it have been lesser of a miracle if Jesus had taken the two fish and five loaves and only fed five people with it? Would it have been a greater miracle if Jesus took the two fish and five loaves and fed five million people with it? The answer to both questions is no, because a miracle, by definition, is something that cannot be done that is done. So it doesn't matter the size as we see it from our perspective because we need to measure the impact, not the activity. And sometimes we don't see all the impact. Sometimes it'll be an eternity when we find out that that smile we gave to somebody at the bus stop kept them from committing suicide that day. We don't know always the impact of what we do, but God is ordering our steps. And God orders individual steps and he orders the steps of the congregation as a group. God is up now. I'm going to tell you something that you might like or not like. You're planning to close on a property on Wednesday. God might shut that down and you not get it. Now, I'm not wishing that because I know the angst that comes with it. But I was just at a church opening where they had gone to closing on three properties. On at the table, the deals fell apart three times. And then finally, they got the last one, which was a better situation than all the ones before. God is always trying to give us our best when we're trying to give us what we think we can have. So whether the door opens or whether the door closes, our prayer should be not my will, but thine be done. Yes. And let me see what, now Jesus, we're coming to a close now. Jesus, in the garden of Gethsemane, knew what he was to do. He knew that he was going to die on a cross with torture and pain. And he didn't want to do it. He prayed three times, Lord, if it be possible, if there's any other plan you can come up with, I don't want to go through that. I would prefer to do it another way. That was his prayer. So it's okay when we're in our prayer closet and we're going through a storm and we don't see a way out and we're crying to God, God, where are you? What are you doing? Why is it that I'm going through this so long? Why? 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 But here's what we must do as Jesus did. He said, nevertheless, even though I don't want this, even though I don't like the plan, even though I know that's your will, nevertheless, not my will, not what I want, not what I can see, not what I think I want to experience, but your will be done. I'm here to exercise my faith in what you see that I may not see. Because I know he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I can ask or think to ask. I want you to exercise your faith. But I don't have much, don't need much. <laughs> if you have just as much as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Amen. And as your faith grows, 
you'll move bigger mountains and you'll see bigger miracles and you begin then because of your existential experience to walk by faith knowing that's way better than walking by sight. Amen. I wish that for you. Jesus saw it. Jesus knew it. Jesus did it. That's why he was able to go all the way to the cross and save somebody while he was dying for their sin. Can you imagine that? One thief cursing at him, the other thief said, look, I know we're up here because we did everything they said we did, and we're dying because we're supposed to. But he didn't do anything. So remember me when you come in your kingdom. Jesus, not missing a beat, though suffering and dying himself, said, I tell you today, you will be with me. Why? Because you believed in me before you even knew me. Now we claim to know it. Do we believe in it? Yes. So on the cross, Jesus took every one of our sins. On the cross, Jesus made a way for us to be saved. On the cross, he did everything necessary to make sure if we want to, we can be like that thief on the cross. We deserve to die, but I'm asking that you would save me. Remember me when you come. Jesus can say it to you right now. Today I can tell you, you will be with me. Here's the beauty of being a Christian. I don't have to wonder whether I'm saved or lost. See, a lot of people who call themselves Christians don't know whether they're going to heaven when Jesus comes. The, one of the advantages of being a Christian is knowing where you're going to end up. <laughs> he says all you've got to do is trust me. If, you, if anybody in my Father's hand, nobody can take them out. But this is like eternal, to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Notice he didn't say, and this is like eternal, to know all the 28 fundamental beliefs, and to practice them perfectly, know every prophecy in scripture, and, and be able to teach it like our teacher was this morning, to know all, to keep the Sabbath and don't break any of that. None of that is in the, in, in the verse. He said, this is like eternal, to know thee, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The only reason I keep the Sabbath is because I'm saved. I don't keep the Sabbath to be saved. I keep the Sabbath because I'm already saved. Amen. I didn't change my diet to be saved. I changed my diet because I'm already saved. I don't, you know, you name any of the 28. I don't keep any of them to be saved. I do them because I'm already saved. Yeah. And when Jesus comes or if I die first, doesn't matter, I will be with him. Like, like, like Job said, though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Amen. I hope you believe it. Father, I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice, whether in person or online, would agree with me that we have enough faith to accomplish anything God has willed in our life. That we have enough faith to accept the free gift of salvation and to know we are saved and not wonder if we're going to make it. I ask that that peace would pass, that passes understanding would pass to everyone under the sound of my voice and that they would be witnesses of Christ to others that many more will be saved. Let the impact of this message reach eternity Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for a closing song.
May the Holy Spirit be with us. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming today.